Nicholas uh, Dennis Bradley. Uh, until recently, Dennis was uh, co-chairman of the consultative group in the past, which published their report last January. Uh, and today, Dennis is going to talk on can we yet deal with the past? Dennis. Thank you. Hello. When, when I was asked to do this, uh, I wasn't too sure exactly the topic. And I woke up this morning and I'm even less sure. I am a completely ad hoc person depending on the mood, and today I am in an extremely giddy mood. I am not in the mood for serious lectures. I am not in the mood for constructed, uh, well-ordered lectures, because I get the feeling that this is the beginning of exam time. I have two sons doing exams, one in Glasgow and one in Dublin today. So in some ways I think that's filling my soul with old memories of what it was like to be inducted into the world of university examinations and all the angst and uh, worry that goes with that as a young student, and yet the feeling that you were coming to the end of the road of something, that something was ending and something was coming to a, to a conclusion. So anyway, I'm giddy. I'm not really in the mood for very structured lectures. Can we deal with the past? I haven't a notion, but I'll tell you my story a little bit. When I was asked to do the job of constructing a consultation along with other people and constructing a report into how possibly we might deal with our past, I said no. I said it's too difficult. I said only a fool would do that. The first time I was ever asked was 8 o'clock in the morning. And I said, you're an idiot to ask me at 8 o'clock in the morning. If you had any wit and if you had any understanding of the human psyche, you would come at 12 o'clock at night with a bottle of whiskey. And then you may get a maybe at that stage, but certainly at this stage you're getting a downright no, because it's nearly impossible to deal with our past. A number of people had kind of gone around the ages and margins of the past and had got slightly burned. Uh, politicians, particularly, uh, some civil servants, uh, others had gone round the margins and just drawn out the margins, but kind of decided well, they weren't going much deeper into the swamp. So they kind of did a little bit and then withdrew gracefully uh, and with a little bit of their spirit left. Having said that, I was persuaded that perhaps it should be tried. The other big question was, was the timing right? Because around the time that I was asked to do the job, uh, Spain had kind of had a fresh out outbreak of past events. And they had decided that perhaps they should re-examine uh, their issue around and their dead and their conflict around their, 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 <coughs> their civil war. And about the thousands of people who had been killed and about the people who had been compensated and the people who hadn't been compensated. That was kind of breaking out again uh, within Spain. And we probably had the notion that Spain was a reasonably settled country uh, and that they hadn't fought their war since around the, the 1940s or uh, beginning 40s anyway. So I suppose I also realized that they would only ask people to do this job who were dead weight, who had no future who had no political ambitions, and who had nowhere else to go. <laughs> because anybody with a career path in front of them would not undertake to look at our past. You see, the difficulty in some ways with our past is it's so long. It is probably the longest past that exists in historical political terms, and unresolved still. Because even though I suppose the outline and the definition was about 40 years ago, that we should examine the last 40 or 45 years or so forth, the truth is that that is not the delineating situation at all. The delineating, delineating situation is about 400 years old because we are still fighting the same struggles. 
not just up to two years ago, but actually in Newton Hamilton yesterday and Craig Avon four weeks ago or whatever it was. It's the same old battle. It's the same old struggle. It's the same old definitions. Um, so it's a 400-year re-examination of something. And you don't put that into a report, and you cannot contain that within the, the verbiage of a report. All you can do in some ways is try to come up with some kind of considered position that actually perhaps skeleton-wise maps out some kind of methodology or underlying process that may allow for a better future, that may allow for a better future. And I think, reflecting on something that I heard yesterday, because I think that this today is, or this week rather, is uh, Community Relations Week. Uh, I didn't know that, by the way, until I got up yesterday morning and listened to BBC Radio 5, and then I heard my friend Duncan Morrow talk about Community Relations Week, and he was coming down to the city to talk. But Duncan, as usual, says a whole lot of things that are very wise. And he did say that uh, something along the lines that um, silence is normally, silence in Northern Ireland and in Irish, Anglo-Irish terms, is normally a sign that there's a hell of a lot of things happening underneath the surface. And I suppose in some ways, over 400 years, uh, when we didn't come to terms with this issue, or, you're very welcome. It gives me another two minutes that I can mark off that I haven't to talk to, so that's, that is very welcome. Anyway, Duncan said something about community relations, and he said the problem is that uh, we can we can kind of keep, keep silent, silent about it, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing happening underneath the surface. So in some ways, I suppose, for all the reasons that I was, a, that I was a kind of past it, uh, I was going into my retirement years, I had some kind of feel for the past. I had some kind of some kind of insight that the past was burdening us and I suppose I also had some kind of insight that I, I had sympathy for the politicians that it was too difficult to deal with, that it really was the third rail, as the Americans call it, and that if you touched it, you got burned. So I had some sympathy that politicians who were trying to construct a methodology of putting an administration and a settlement of a sort together, up in Stormont, and coming from the backgrounds and the history and the narrative that they were all carrying, that in doing that, to also deal with the past was also to ask too much. So some idiots should go and try and do it and try to set out some kind of definition and format and process. Now that does not mean to believe, to say that I believed in any way that any politician would ever acknowledge that or ever thank you for that. But that was okay. That's part of the process also. The other thing, I suppose, that made me ultimately say yes was that I, I heard a strong argument coming from one particular party, there's no sense in not mentioning, from the SDLP, which said that the, uh, but they weren't the only party, but they certainly were, I think, the strongest one in identifying this, that the, whatever process into the future should be led by victims, should be victim-led. And some part of me inside screamed, no. Some part of me inside screamed, no. Not right, wrong definition, complete misunderstanding of a whole lot of things. I suppose the thing I have done for a good part of my life is, is acted as a counsellor or therapist, particularly within the addiction field, alcohol and drugs. And I remember one day sitting in in a group, with a group of, with a number of men, I don't think there was any woman in the group, and uh, 
this very severe alcoholic person shouted at me, what the F would you know about addiction? So you're not addicted. You're not alcoholic. What would you know about it? And I suppose that memory rose up in me when I heard the SDLP say it should be victim led. It shouldn't be victim led, in my opinion. Victims are too hurt, too fragmented, too biased, in the proper sense of biased, too full, too immediate. And the second long definition about that is that there is an assumption in that that you can only understand something if you've experienced it. And God looked to us if that's true. As if the human mind and the human imagination and the human heart cannot go down a journey on its own is a complete wrong definition and misunderstanding of the human being and the human possibility. And I do not accept it and will not accept it. And the third reason is that modern society has become afraid of victims. And if you want to see that really being lived out, watch it within the Catholic Church at this moment of time. We have become afraid of victims. And that has two outcomes. First of all, it means that we don't, it means that we don't tell them the truth. We run away from them. We don't engage them in honest, open conversation. It quite often leads victims to distraction, and it quite often brings out an even uglier side of the issue. And people become embittered and become entrapped within their own embitterment. And they fight with each other in a fashion which is quite scary and which drives the rest of society away from them. And I think that's wrong. I think it's bad for society, and I think it's bad for the victims' groups, or groups, whatever way you want to call them. Anyway, said yes. And we did a report after a long consultation. If you haven't read the report, I cannot give it to you within 20 minutes. It's a big, complex piece of work. If you have read it, then you have your own views already. I will object to you if you criticize me and have arrests. <laughs> I really will object. <laughs> because I stand stood outside enough shows and enough picture houses with people fundamentalists telling me that that's a bad picture and they have, or that's a bad film and they haven't seen it. I used to be tolerant of that. I'm not so tolerant of it anymore. If you want to criticize it, at least read it. At least know what's in it. Because it was a lot of work put in by a lot of people, and they had great integrity, the people who put it in. They weren't perfect, weren't perfect, but they, they tried hard, and they listened hard. The other thing I learned was that I thought I knew a lot about victims and about the past and about our history. And when I went into that area, it would have broke your heart. In fact, I think it slightly did break my heart. And I think I haven't fully recovered. I think the memories are still there. The memories of the hurt, the memories of the disappointment, the memories of the of the disappointment like like paint beginning to peel off a wall or beginning to slightly come off a wall as the rains come down and the reality of life was opening up to people. That they weren't going to get what they were hoping for. Or that they had been told lies. But there wasn't going to be the delivery. So I think that I, it slightly broke my heart. And I also think that a lot of the victims groups thought that we were their enemy. And it took them nine months to realize that, in fact, we were not their enemy. That we were the best friends that they possibly could have got. I think it took about six to nine months for that to happen. Why? 
because they were, they like all of us were fighting the old political battles. Who's a victim, who's not a victim? Who was right and who was wrong? Who was more writer than the other writer? And who was wronger than the other wronger? And that they would stand out for it and they would get what they were looking for. And then they began to realize that as the politics got more complicated, the politicians began to pull back from them. So if I was looking at the elections at the moment and I was a victim in Northern Ireland, I would say we're not very high on the agenda. Victims groups didn't, didn't think we were their friends. Right? And they fought with each other and they fought with each other. But in some ways I didn't mind that. The best dramatization of reconciliation that I have ever seen was done by the BBC recently. It was called Five Minutes of Heaven. It starred Nesbitt and it starred Big Tall Boy from Balamina. <laughs> Neeson. Mm -hmm. Superb piece of drama. Two people coming together. How does it end? Two of them fight with each other. In fact, they fall out of a building. But they had to have the fight, and all that the reconciliation was ultimately about was one saying to the other, I need to get you out of my head. It wasn't a big anything other than getting you out of my head. And sometimes reconciliation is about getting you out of my head, to allow space inside my head for other things to happen. Anyway, the big cries within that period, of, within that consultation were for Justice was one of the big cries. People who felt that they had been, what they had done, I suppose this was coming mostly, but not exclusively, mostly from the unions community, which was, we stood by the law, we did the law, we were promised that the law would see us through, we, would see, we were promised that the law would always be there. And that when the conflict and the troubles and the killing finished, that people would be made accountable to the law. And instead what we got was a British government made in a deal with the old enemy and there's no law anymore. They let them out of, not alone, they let them out of prison and now they're not even looking for them. It was roughly, I suppose, very editorialized one type of situation. The other, mostly but not exclusively, coming from the nationalist Republican community was we want truth. Because the truth of the matter is we want to prove to ourselves and to our children and to our grandchildren and to the world that we were not the only exclusive perpetrators, killers within this issue. Police were up to their necks and the MI5 were up to their necks and the British government were up to their necks and Maggie Thacker Thatcher was up to their necks and so forth. And we were, we take responsibility but we don't take the full responsibility. So you had justice on one side and you had truth on the other side. And justice would fight with truth within our Northern Ireland situation. It is not easy to come up with a series of proposals that actually try to deal with both of those very just and worthy desires. And of course the third desire is to put it all away, to get rid of it. And that's no bad desire either. We do have the right to move past the past. And society does have the right to get bored with the past. And society does have the right to say you will not hold us back forever. You being whoever you are within that past. Society does have that right. Surely it has of that right. But society is foolish as has been proved over and over and over again, to think that the past will just disappear if you ignore it. That it will not find its ways of coming up through the surface. That it will, that if you put it down, it will come back up. It happens in most countries. It happens in all countries where there's been conflict. And yet I think that the political desire is to put it away, to put it down put it out of sight and leave it at least for another generation or leave it forever if possible. 
So justice and truth, I suppose, were the big cries, were the big desires. And we tried to construct a way within the knowledge that 40 years on or 30 years on or 20 years on or 10 years on, you cannot get full justice because the, the information isn't there, the personnel aren't there, the uh, forensics aren't there, nor indeed is the desire there. So 40 years on or 30 years on, you can't get full justice, but can you get any justice? 40 years on, you can't get the full truth, no matter what you think the truth is. You cannot get to the full, complete, total truth. And anyway, in Christ's words, what is truth? Or was it Jesus' words? What was Christ? Uh, what is truth? Anyway. But within the limitations, can you get somewhere? Or can you do your best? So we came up with a very complex set of proposals. A set of proposals roughly where, yes, you would try to do with justice. You would try to do it within a period of five years. You would set up a, a legacy commission, very well staffed, very well appointed, that would try to get as much of the cases that wanted to deal with the justice issue into a situation where if justice was possible, and was becoming less and less, in the narrow sense of judicial justice, was becoming less and less possible as the time went past, but there at least was some possibility, and if people wanted to hold on to that and wanted to pursue that, that there was a methodology. And we proposed that, and it's in the report. And we did the truth issue on the, on the grounds that there, whatever truth is there and whatever methodology there is at getting at the truth, that it could be got through this process. And it held up that possibility to people. And we also then proposed all kinds of things outside of all of that, particularly within the broader society, that we should be trying for reconciliation within this community. But reconciliation in a, ru in a real and true fashion which was have the hard conversations, face up to the difficulties, look at our education system. Is it right to do all kinds of radical proposals about changing the nature of schools, but not look at the possibility of integrating schools in a proper economic fashion, whereby we cannot afford perhaps any more, at least within that economic reality, that we cannot afford any money more to have two streams of education just to suit our sectarian needs. And the challenge to the Christian churches perhaps to face up to their past and to their history, who gave us the, de who gave us the words, who gave us the language that allowed our sectarianism to actually increase and to boil and to face up to all of those issues that our politicians would face up to it, that our Deputy First Minister and First Minister would give a speech once a year, for example, about the state of reconciled communities within Northern Ireland, that we would have methodologies where difficult stories would be told, not just about individual pasts and individual stories, but that communities would have the right to tell those stories, and there would be methodologies to let those stories be heard. For example, the story of, I think, the unionist community, particularly in the border areas, who believed that republicanism was out to create genocide towards them. I think that's a very important story, badly documented, badly told, and hasn't been properly told yet. And I think it's very important here. Because I've heard Republicans say that's a lot of nonsense. They never believed that. Crap. Well, you go into some of the unionist communities within in the Protestant areas, within the border areas, and come out and tell me that that's crap. Because it isn't. And I have heard people, well, I've heard people who tell me that the best way to deal with this is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And there's another piece of crap. We are not Truth and Reconciliation type people the bottom line. We're not African. We are a reserved people. We are a reserved people in the sense that we are private people. They're very private people. We don't do public as well as other nations sometimes do it. 
And anyway, the Truth and Reconciliation in South Africa has many question marks over its efficacy and efficiency. Many questions. And thirdly, who the hell is going to pay for it anyway? Republicans tell me that the United Nations are going to pay for it. Pull me other leg. It's just not true. It is not true. And some if people within the Republican nationalist community believe there's going to be a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they are fooling themselves and their grandchildren. Just not going to happen. And don't let Jerry Adams or Martin McGuinness or anybody else tell you it is. It is not going to happen. And I get angry with politicians when they tell lies at that level. Don't mind them telling lies at other levels. Politicians some days have to tell lies. But not at that level. That's too big a lie. Too big a lie. Hurting too many people. On the other hand, there are outrageous, outrageous on the issue of collusion, which unionism needs to face up to and stop telling themselves lies about. The British were as dirty as the British can be over 40 years. And stop telling yourselves lies that it was an odd bad apple in the odd barrel. It was political. It was policy. It may not have been 12 people smoking cigars in 12 rooms, but it was within the system. And some of it is not nice to see when you get close to it. It is not nice to see. So stop telling lies about that. But have the conversations. We can begin to relate to each other. We may argue with each other. We may fight with each other for a period of time. I think the report will probably never be implemented, sadly. I think so. Sad about that. Because it's a very good report. Very clever report, if I may say so myself. I think it's a very worthy report. We heard, we really heard people. They thought we didn't hear them. We heard them. We heard their cry. And we agreed with their cry. And we put it down on record, and we handed it to the politicians, and the politicians said, go away, too dangerous. That's what I think happened. I think they were surprised at what we handed to them. I think they thought we had handed them a much less fulsome thing. A little bit here and a little bit there, but not really face the issue. I think that's what happened. And I might be wrong, because we did say, we didn't think our politicians could handle it and the two governments should handle it and pay for it. And somebody then said it was too dear. And I really got angry. Too dear? Well, I'll not do the old kind of cliche about how look at the banks, but I do say look at the Presbyterian Mutual Society. 52 million. 52 million, like that, we are told. It's coming from the executive and the possibility of a backup of 200 million going into the Presbyterian Mutual Society. Now, I'm all for that money going into the Presbyterian Mutual Society. No pro well, I'm not all for it. I'm a wee bit for it. I'm not against it, right? We costed this thing at 300 million pound, 100 million of which was to go into therapy, addiction and trauma. Right? So we're down into 200 million. 40 million was to go direct, immediately, to, to all victims. All victims. All, sorry. And victims being the families of those who were killed during the trouble. All the families of those who were killed during the trouble. And then people tell me about, this is going to an IRA. No IRA man, UVF man, British soldier who was killed in the troubles was to get one penny. It was the families who were to get the penny. Because they are the definite, defined victims in, in statute. And that was 40 million. So we're now down to 160 million. And we're doing it over five years. And we're taking out the HET and putting it in with the Ombudsman's office, so we're actually saving another 50 million. And we're now down to reasonable money because we're asking the Aries to put in a bit of money. Right? We were dealing with, comp with 
achievable and are dealing with achievable sums of money that were not going to cost this economy fortunes. So I don't accept the argument that it was too expensive. And thirdly, we think it could have been done in five years. I say it was five and a half, but it's five years. Could have been done because the process in the report deals with the complexities of how to deal with that. We also ruled out or recommended that there be no more tribunal for all the reasons that we talked about. Too expensive, didn't deliver, weren't sensitive enough, uh, and didn't always get to the truth. Anyway, it was a weird kind of experience. I was very privileged and very lucky that the people who walked the road with me, I think, were the finest among the finest people that I've ever worked with. Amongst the finest. Not the finest. Amongst the finest I've ever worked. They were good. They were anxious. Um, maybe I'm too pessimistic. Maybe some of the politicians might get a handle on this. I doubt it. And I think that's unfair, not just to individual victims, but I think it's unfair to this society. I think this society needs to analyze itself. I think this would be a good place to explore, actually, the, our own history in that sense of the past. I think there's much to be learned politically. I think that there is much to be learned about conflict and how not to deal with conflict. I think there is much to be learned about uh, negotiation. I think there is much to be learned about how you reconcile a very divided and divided community. I think there is much to be learned. I think it will be a shame if that is not learned. I hope it's learned. I hope that after the election, better things kick in. I'm not so convinced that will happen. I'm prepared to answer any question that you throw at me or ask me. Um, and if I can answer it, I will do my best. And I thank you, and I am amazed that you would actually come and listen. Thank you. Thank you. Agreed to, to some questions. Um, just we're going to be pushed for time. Obviously, a big crowd. There's bound to be a lot of questions. So, a couple of suggestions was, I would like to make. First thing, I'll probably maybe ask for groups of questions, maybe in groups of three. So, I'll take maybe three people at a time. Um, secondly, uh, if you try to keep your question um, relatively brief and short, I'll try to make sure, try to sure that Dennis keeps his answers relatively brief and short. Uh, and third and finally, just again for recording purposes, if you could maybe just give your name and if you'd like to give your affiliation, that would be, that would be great. So I'll ask for the first question. <coughs> Dennis, my name is Danny Bradley, as you know. My question to you would be, uh, and I, you were adamant in this question, the truth and justice. Uh, you mentioned Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams telling the, the people it's lies. How do you know and you're so determined why there will not be no truth and justice. Can you answer that? I'll take another two in this stage. Dennis, thank you very much for your, for your open uh, presentation. Uh, Jillian Robinson from INCOR. One of the things that um, saddens me as I listen to what you're saying is that you're saying you're more or less convinced that the report will not be implemented. And obviously, the whole process of generating the report was very heartbreaking, as you said yourself, for yourself and the others working with you, not to mention all the many people who came and gave testimony and contributed. If the report isn't implemented, do you think that we're in the position that, in, say, another three or four years, we'll go through a similar process to what your group went through uh, again? Um, I'm just curious how you think things will work out. Sorry, all right. Danny, um, why am I so sure? Because there is no mechanism. The British government will never do it. The Irish government will never do it. The British and Irish governments together will never do it. So who will do it? The response to that is the United Nations will never do it. Or sorry, the United Nations will do it. The United Nations are broke, big time broke. And even if they weren't broke, even if they had a pot of gold, they wouldn't do it. Because they would say, excuse us, we're not going into two Western countries that are quite rich to do this type of work. 
no chance. And thirdly, there's no, there is no political uh, lobbying for it. Jerry Adams and Martin McGinnis might say it in odd time, but there's no political lobbying for it. And the United Nations have never done it and will not do it. Uh, so that's why I think it will never happen. So you're actually telling me that Jerry Adams and Martin McGinnis Well, if they, if, they, if they keep saying, it's my opinion that to keep saying that there will be a Truth and Reconciliation Commission or process, whatever, is not the truth. It will not happen, and I don't think that the people who are saying it actually believe it will happen either. So that's what I'm saying to that. Going on to Gillian's thing. I don't fully know the answer. Um, I think that the group actually, I think that the report was not fruitless. I think it defined a whole lot of things. I think it actually clarified, I think, a whole lot of things. It was a little bit like the five minutes of heaven. It had the fight and it had the contact and it took some of the steam out of the situation. So I think it allowed a whole lot of things to happen. But in some ways, it allowed a whole lot of things to happen for politicians, right? And not necessarily for the people who are most hurt. That's what saddens me. So I think that the politicians in a very clever, it's not that they used it or in a clever way, but the outcome, the unseen outcome was that we had our five minutes of heaven, we had our fights, we had all those types of things. We're now not fighting as much about who's a victim and so forth. We're not fighting around that issue. We're not even fighting. And all the kind of politicians have said, oh, we saw what happens when you touch that, so we're all kind of away from here, right? So they're all getting on with their other work, and that's a good thing in itself, and that's, that's a kind of a good positive outcome. And we also now have a definition in some ways of what it all, of, of, a definition that we didn't have before. I think that about three times the governments have walked over to the bin to do that. Walk back. For this reason. I think that they got a sense that if we put this in the bin, what comes down the road? So I think that while they would like to put it in the bin, they're afraid to put it in the bin. Because I think that the actual politicians who actually are saying nothing at the moment will suddenly turn on them. And the same politicians who are not kind of making this a big issue in the elections or anything like that will suddenly turn on whoever puts it in the bin. So I think there are dynamics in there which are kind of hard, <coughs> to, to, or hard to predict. What will happen? I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea. Um, I really don't know. I'll, I'll there is one possibility that the Libyans will come charging in on the white horses. <laughs> eh? And they'll put a billion pounds on the table. And then the governments are really in trouble because the victims are no longer saying that it's only one group of victims have to get that money. So they'll all go across the all go across the range, so you sort out your victims, and I think there would, there would be money then to do a legacy commission, and I think the governments could refuse to do it. So it could be ironic that the Libyans actually make this report a reality. But if it's left to the two governments, I doubt it. A couple more questions. Thank you. Here's Little Lynch, Western Voice, uh, Victims of Terrorism Group. I didn't think Dennis I would ever come out with these words, but I appreciate what you said there today. didn't agree with it all. Didn't agree maybe with much of it, but I appreciated the way that you presented yeah, your uh, um, your talk. A couple of things in my mind. Why is there this obsession amongst people like yourself and organisations like the, the consultative group in the past? An obsession with the exclusive use of inclusive language to the exclusion of language of dis differentiation which I think is much more truthful. And the second part is, why is it that every single report that has been commissioned by government bodies has all mysteriously dovetailed perfectly with prevailing government policies? Could you repeat the first part of the question? <laughs> Happy to, yeah. Why is there this obsession with the exclusive use of inclusive language. In other words, that's the only language that is used in all these reports that have been commissioned by government, to the exclusion of the language of differentiation. Okay. 
Can I think about that one? Yeah, please do. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hello, um, my name is Shirley McMichael. I'm a member of the Forum for Victims and Survivors. Um, and just, uh, uh, actually, would just maybe like to make a comment or only more than a question to Dennis because I um, personally thank Dennis for the work that he has done because um, on the forum you have set down a great, you know, the, the report has actually helped us sit down and talk about things within the forum. There's about 30, 40 people in the forum, you know, and there's a member of someone who has been involved in maybe every atrocity from, you know, the Abercorn to T-Bat to everything. There's someone on that forum. And, you know, we're all getting on well. We're actually, within the next month or so, we'll be putting out some reports. And a lot of it is through with the work that, you know, that you have done, Dennis, and sort of great work there. But it has helped us to sit down and give a good base to talk about things. And very honest, you know, sort of communication is going on there. And... I've learned, I mean, I've learned about, I, I, my background would be, my husband was a, a senior member of the UDA. I don't know if somebody used to be my age group might remember John McMichael, but I am sort of coming from that sort of background. And, and be able to talk to people whose families were involved in the IRA, there was someone, and, and it really made me sit up and think on the forum, she sat down and she said to me, um, you know, when Bloody Sunday happened in Derry, my two brothers were 12 and 14. I mean, they were just ripe for going into the IRA. And it was the same in sort of my community as well. So just to give that wonderful understanding, and I just want to say there is some real good work going on there and some really good understanding. And I would just, I mean, I just love you to pieces, Dennis, and I think you have a great, wonderful spirit. And don't hide yourself. Come out and give that message to a whole lot of people because, you know, it really does affect people's hearts. Thank you. <laughs> I want the answer. <laughs> um, you can obviously see there's a long love affair here going on for about 20 <laughs> years, right? So we, we've just passed that one by, right? Uh, it's now open, out in the open. I, I'd ask Charlie not to reveal it, but uh, it's kind of now out in the open, right? <laughs> I would like to compliment Shirley too. I did work with Shirley and she was an absolute joy to work with. Way outside the victims were so together on policing. She was an absolute joy. I mean, I don't know, has that exclusive language and inclusive language uh, differentiation? You have to come, you have to make a judgment somewhere along the line and I think that governments have the right to make a judgment that uh, the underpinning of our future, whatever about our past, is, uh, is inclusive. And no matter what happens in Stormont or what happens in Northern Ireland or what happens to the economy in the South it's, or what happens to the British economy, it is going to be inclusive from here on in. And I think that was a judgment made around 1982 by two governments who then came together and said, we've fought for 400 years, we're not going to stop it. And I think that uh, people think that the, you know, the Good Friday Agreement is the underpinning, or that the St. Andrews Agreement is the underpinning. They're only kind of uh, little dots on the surface of the Anglo-Irish Agreement. The thing that underpins the peace process and that underpins the change is the coming together of the two governments and those two governments will not be shifted. It doesn't matter whether the Conservatives are elected, the Liberals are elected, the thing between Fianna Fáil, Finn Gael, Labour. Those are only kind of passing moments. But the thing that will hold, and is holding, this whole situation together is the Anglo-Irish Agreement. The new and defined relationship which is about inclusivity. And Brian Cowan, who I know and like, and everybody else hates at the moment, uh, said something recently, he said that uh, it's a process that's important, it's not the desk, it's not the where we reach, it's a process that's important. Now, in some ways I want to kill him for saying that because I am an out and out nationalist. Want unity tomorrow. Not because anything other than I think it's better for all of our people. All of us, including unionism, thing me. that's where I come from, that's my political beliefs. So in some ways I'm annoyed with him saying that, but I actually think he's right. 
the process is the important thing. And the process has to be about engagement, but I hate the process that doesn't speak the truth. And I don't mean raw, dogmatic truth. I don't mean truth that has no realization that there are moral differentiations and moral gray areas. I don't mean truth that is so raw that it is nowhere else other than its own voice and hears nothing other than its own echo. Or that defines things so narrowly that it is no space for differentiation in, in other issues. So I am a big believer in inclusivity if it means that there is a toleration for difference, there's a toleration for... Uh, but that in toleration must also include people who are completely and so different that they actually don't hear any longer or don't want to hear or don't want to be involved. You also have to respect that differentiation. But that doesn't make you, and we were accused, by the way, of this, of flattening out all morality. You know, that, in other words, include everything to the point where nothing is any different. That's not what we, that's not what the basis and the heart of this report was about. The heart of the basis of this report was that 400 years brings a lot of things to the table. A lot of history, a lot of, a lot of difference, a lot of experiences, a lot of hurts, a lot of memory, a lot of, uh, a lot of rearing in some ways, you know, people coming from different backgrounds. And that it is only that you can change the past only at the grounds that different moral interpretations in that, you know, I'm Irish, I think that we had the right to, to, uh, to fight for the freedom of our land. I personally think that's crap, but a lot of people don't think that's crap. Uh, I am British, I am Ulster, I'm under siege and I have the right to fight and kill for the, for the preservation of my way of life. I think that's crap. I think people have thought that and feel that and have lived that throughout a long period of time. And the reconciliation is not about avoiding both two situations. It's about talking about them, coming to the common to understand them, common to feel them, that you can tolerate them a bit more. You don't always agree with them. You may find them different, but that the people who are doing them and saying them and living them and experiencing them are not animals, are not uh, devils, are not people who are psychopaths. That's the difference. Or that's what you're trying to kind of come to a place where allows that space of inclusive. Now, I don't know if that's what you meant, but, or if I'm touching on that, but uh, excuse me if it's not, but that. The second thing was, sorry, well, I, I don't even know if I answered your question. You were very philosophical, by the way, and I was having difficulty with... I mean, that's even worse than Over me. lunch? I, no, I'm um, not a bit... Time probably for another couple more questions. Your so good theological to, to raise something? Sorry. Sorry. Did you um, expect the focus of the report to actually hinge on, on the second paragraph, the, the um, acknowledgement payment, or did you think that people would actually see beyond um, the, the um, acknowledgement and the, and the definition of, of victim and actually, I mean, as you said at the outset, read the whole report first? Did I think that um, it was a real problem if we put if we if we backed away from it we weren't being truthful to ourselves. If we if we backed ourselves into it we were going to create an explosion. But we thought there could have been three other explosions as well. It wasn't just that one. We didn't. I don't think we all thought that this will be the big one. We we were we actually had a discussion at one stage of which of them which of these will blow. Right? Would it be the uh, reckon? Would it be the would it be the definition of victims for a start, or would it be the uh, the money issue, or would it be? I think there was a third one which I forget now, John. But we did. But I, we knew. I think we had identified the three big ones, but we didn't realise that one would be the biggest. No, we don't. Don't think we realised that. But it was a big issue. Uh, do we back away from it? Do we become untruthful? Do we become politically astute? Do we do it in such a fashion that thing? Do we leave it for another day? All of those things come up. And I think we came to the conclusion, 
to hell with it, right? We're trying to be truthful here, let's be let's go with what we believe and what we think is the right place to go and hopefully time will will will, will sort that out. But I don't know if it was right or not. Some of my best friends in the media said you're an idiot battle. You're a complete stupid idiot. You should have seen it, you should have felt it, you knew exactly what was coming down the road. You handled it like a stupid idiot and you should have put it away from you and you should have, you know, let it come another ten years down the road. That's a fair point of view. Uh, I don't know if they're right or whether they're wrong. I think they're wrong, but maybe they're right. Um, Mary Lynch from Incor. Um, I just wanted to uh, kind of raise the issue that during the, the presentation you've been saying that implementation of the report relies on the political will for the implementation of the report. And I think that maybe there's something missing from this because um, the conflict was played out at a political level but it was also played out very much in a community level. And we live that conflict in a community level. And while politicians have turned their back away from the report and have you know not taken their role and taken it on, Community projects and community activists have actively engaged with the, the report. They've used it as a, a form of defining their own work, and you've actually given a language into, into the mouths of the community sector that has allowed other people to engage with it. And I suppose my question is, do you think that there is the power and potential within the community sector who have responded well um, to it to, to drive this agenda when politicians are turning their backs um, from it? And by giving the language and giving the courage for those communications to take place, um, you know, I inside community settings, that therefore you're also enabling us to raise our voices up that politicians cannot walk away from this and say that the past is not to be dealt with. Well, thanks very much. Those are very kind words. Um, I hope they're true. Take them as uh, uh, they are very kind and very heartened by them. Again, I don't know. Um, I think we're a tired people. We've been through a lot. I don't know if we have the energy for another fight. You know, I think other communities did a lot around the peace process. I think they were very active and very engaged. And you know, those who were active were really active. And but I think a lot of energy was spent. I think there's been some disappointment. Um, I think that. Uh, surely, you know, the, the, the forum is working much better than I had even expected to at this stage, and I think that's perhaps a big area where energy could come from. Um, I think, I think that my big fear is that politicians will sideline it to a victim's welfare commission. Do you know what I'm? That the energy that will come and the definitions that will come out of that and the engagements they will have with it to implement whatever it is will be victim's welfare. Money for this, money for that, whatever services we need, but not to actually go past that. Now, is there the energy within the forum to generate that plus the other issues? I don't know. Um, I do think we're tired people. I think we've fought a lot of battles. Um, maybe I'm just... Maybe I'm just... Maybe I just need a slap along the ear and a holiday, and you know I might come back next month feeling. Let me tell you, it's all going to happen, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm not. I don't. Don't don't take me. I am in a weird mood today. Uh, it's. It could be different tomorrow. Um, not that my judgment will be different, but maybe my emotions will be different. Therefore, my insights might be slightly different. But I wouldn't be waiting and holding my breath. Is what I'd be saying, right? And therefore, I don't want to give people false hope, because I don't have false hope myself. Um, I don't see, for example, where the, where the leverage, uh, Shirley's uh, victims is a bit, the, the groups you're talking about is a bit, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, it may be the embarrassment of Libya coming along. I don't know if Libya is going to get money, right? I mean, when I, Libya started, I, I was a bit cynical, right? But I do know that there are notes arriving on governmental desks, right? Now, whether they're going to go into anything, I have no idea. But let's say the Libyans, for all kinds of reasons, said, OK, we'll do something. There's a bit of money. Get off our backs, right? I think governments are embarrassed. What do we do with? Who's going to run it? 
Who's going to do? What's the work? What's the definition of it? Uh, is it just about welfare then? Is it just about uh, recognition payment? There might be too much money in the pot for recognition. There may not. Those are kind of unknowns at, the, at this moment of time. So, and Willie Fraser tells me it's about to happen. So, I don't know. Uh, but I do know. I get an odd week inside every so often, and I did meet a civil servant, and he said, Well, I saw something come in about that the other day. Right. So there are we movements somewhere. Now, whether it ends up in some, I have no idea. But I would hope that. I really would, and I have prayed that, that would ha something would happen in a positive direction, but you got me on a day which I'm not... Yeah, I'm just going to make one very sure. quick comment yeah, there, yeah. just when it be mentioned, so the, the Libya thing. Yeah. Also, it's a Willie Fraser, and yeah. the Willie Fraser is on the yeah, he is. that he's taken forward. Yeah. I mean, I have had the future turn around say to me, because those people who have had family, who have been involved in the troubles, and there's many of us, you know, many of us, and we all have reasons one thing or another, but we wouldn't see any of it. I mean, I was told directly myself that That's what, you know, the that, that that's, that's what the struggle was about. We are working towards that in the floor, but I think there's been sort of an understanding to really be a good check of the liberty. I'm afraid um, we'll run out of time. I think Dennis is now one of the tired people. So um, on your behalf, I'd like to uh, thank you, thank Dennis for coming along today. And thank you.